Hi, I'm Ashley Gatewood, the Communications and Marketing Director at Sea Free International. And today I am talking to Nigel Harris, AM, FFIA, and CFRE. He's currently in Queensland, Australia. And Nigel is the Managing Director of Nigel Harris and Associates. So thanks, Nigel, for chatting with me today. Thanks, Ashley. It's good to be with you. And so we're on uh, this call for this very esteemed occasion because this year, 2023, Nigel celebrates 30 years as a CFRE. And not only that, but he is currently the person in Australia who has held the CFRE the longest. So that's quite a distinction. It is, isn't it? It's, uh, perhaps a, a badge of honor of being just around for a long time, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of neat. Hmm. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about what value the CFRE had on your career when you certified initially in 1993 and then over the following three decades, the value that has continued to bring to you. So when I first attained my CFRE uh, 30 years ago, uh, I'd been working in fundraising practice for nine years prior to that. And certainly early on in my career, it occurred to me that just saying that I knew things, in fact, even more than that, perhaps testing myself that I actually knew what I was doing, wasn't enough to give me the confidence and others the confidence that I could actually do my job in the best way possible. So from early on, I identified there was a need to learn and certainly I took opportunities in terms of continuing professional development to do that. I undertook uh, further tertiary studies early into my fundraising career. I went back to a tertiary study after having left that, uh, well, after leaving school, and took on qualifications in public relations and then marketing. But the thing that was really the gap for me was the independent or objective evidence that I actually knew what I was talking about in fundraising practice and the self challenge that in fact confirm that I did, that I had a, a body of knowledge that was applicable. So when CFRE first came into Australia, in fact, it was in 1992 that the idea that we adopt the practice credential, CFRE, uh, that was currently, uh, had been in place in the US and Canada for a decade or more before that, uh, yep. that we ushered that in. So. I was involved in Fundraising Institute Australia's board or council as it was then and was invited to be part of a group of people that actually introduced the credential into Australia. And as part of that, that initial group needed to actually sit the CFRE exam and attain CFRE so that we actually had the access and the licence to usher that into the Australian market. And that was something we did in the January of 1993. and. Um, in the February of 93, found out we passed uh, at CFRE, attained CFRE, and, uh, um, and I've been a CFRE ever since. So, uh, uh, but it was very much this question of how I actually guess validated is the right word to use, really gave some substance. It certainly gave me confidence in what I knew and what I was building my knowledge base on from that point onwards as well. And that's certainly critical in the continuing professional practice and providing evidence of that. I think certainly the value to prospective employers for those that understood that was an important component uh, of both advocating for yourself in terms of your practice competencies, but uh, perhaps bringing a sense of differentiated offer as well uh, from a, an evidence-based perspective around fundraising practice. And that makes sense. A lot of people want to be sure that they have the skills that they think they have and the best way to do that is to measure that through an exam and study. And on to our second question, why do you feel that it is important for fundraising professionals in Australia to hold a globally recognized credential, not a credential that's specifically Australian? There are a couple of reasons there, I think. Actually, I think the, the challenge in the fundraising marketplace, and certainly in Australia and probably regionally, is that and this is true 30 years ago, and I still think it is true, that we really don't have the scale to 
be able to invest in and adopt a credential that is bespoke to Australia. Mm -hmm. So rather than reinvent that wheel, moving to a broader marketplace, US, Canada as a basis, made a lot of sense then and it still makes a lot of sense now. I think the, the fundamental tenets of professional fundraising practice, in my observation, are the same at an international level. So we really don't deviate a lot from each other. Yes, there are applied elements of practice that are specific in different geographical domains and even in subsets of those geographical domains. But the core tenets of practice, in my experience and observation, don't really vary that significantly. I think the other challenge is that, well, certainly in an Australian context, we really don't have the body of literature that's available that is, again, unique to Australia. In fact, really, we have none in, in, in frank assessment. Certainly, we've got a burgeoning body of research that's here and that uh, complements international research. But once again, we turn to literature that comes out of US, Canada, UK in the main. And so it makes sense that any practice assessment would come from that same source as well. I think the other question that has certainly been apparent in the you know, 40 years I've been in the sector now is that fundraising as a practice is very different from what we often imagine fundraising to be. So from outside looking in, we perhaps see things that we may believe to be so, but actually from inside looking out, it's a very different uh, practice and informed by a lot of different knowledge sets. But that aside, because of that, that vagary around understanding of what um, fundraising practice is, because of the, what I'll call, inconsistent pathways to fundraising practice. That is, you can pretty well wake up one morning and decide to be a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. There's a sector that still is heavily um, focused around making things up. And I say that quite bluntly, we can be very prone to creating whatever uh, narrative we want around fundraising practice and that sort of becomes our truth. So the role a practice credential plays in grounding practice knowledge on independently presented and assessed evidence in literature informed by research is absolutely critical. One of the observations I've made is that people confuse knowing things with doing things. I often hear the critique that, well, CFRE may not make you a better fundraising practitioner. Absolutely true. Um, what you know and what you do are two very different things, but it will inform you in as much as give you the confirmation of your knowledge base and, and then challenge you to attend to continuing learning so that you give yourself every possible chance of being the best you can be in your practice. What you do after that is up to you. So I think that this uh, criticism that sometimes comes up, well, I see people with CFRE who may not be great practitioners. It's got nothing to do with the credential. It's got nothing to do with the intent of the credential. It's got nothing to do with anything, quite frankly. It's just what is in in all manners of uh, vocations. So I think the this notion of fundraising practice needing to stand for something is critical. C practice credentialing is one of the core tenets of that professional identity framework that a fundraising practitioner might look to. CFRE is the only international practice credential in the world. And it makes sense to have an international credential because it does truly traverse borders and is informed by and continues to inform the growing body of knowledge. So I think that part of it is particularly important. And you know, we struggle in fundraising practice still. And, and once again, I've observed this for the four decades I've been in the sector, to get cut through at times with institutional leadership, particularly executive and board level. So I would say fundraising practitioners need to do everything they can to give themselves the basis upon which they present a unique proposition in terms of their knowledge set and their capability set. And yes, uh, higher education is part of that, practice experience is part of that, personal capability is part of that, but practice credentialing is a fundamental tenet which is really unambiguous and immutable. Can you be a good fundraising practitioner without it? Sure, of course you can, yeah. But that doesn't actually negate the importance of the credential. And that 
I think that that grounding positioning that it offers, the consistency in a broadly represented credential that, that many thousands of other people also hold carries huge weight. And you know, I think the sector probably is still lagging behind in really stepping up to the challenge of attending to uh, attain CFRE and um, you know, a whole lot more people really probably need to get a rattle on and um, and get their practice credential and then sustain it. Yeah, and you make some very good points. And I think when I think of Australians, I think of how international Australians are in that so many have lived in the UK mm -hmm. or have family in New Zealand or, you know, have spent time in Canada extensively or whatever that might be. And so wherever your career would take you, your CFRE is going to mean the same thing no matter which country you're working in or where you have donors. Well, that part is true. And it's one of those points of commonality, isn't it, across different um, borders that uh, one of the few things that might actually really provide a, a point of reference. So, yeah, I would agree. And our final question that we were going to talk about today is around employers. We know that in Australia, employers may not have a complete understanding of the CFRE, that maybe they've not hired many people with it. And there is growing awareness for the CFRE in Australia over the last five years, especially. We've just seen fantastic growth there. But for employers who feel like is this important for me to hire somebody with a CFRE? Does the CFRE bring something else to the team? What would be your thoughts? Well, I think there's a real challenge for employers, and I'm talking both in a direct sense, uh, organisational management, but even at a governance level, I think that's an area that warrants some greater attention than it probably gets. Having been an employer of quite a large fundraising team in the past, in uh, my past long-term role as a foundation CEO, I had a strong preference, particularly in terms of more senior appointments to employ people with CFRE. Now, that wasn't always possible with uh, uh, the market still being reasonably thin in terms of CFRE, but one of the positions we did adopt, and I guess I pushed strongly for this, was that if we did employ people in senior roles who didn't have CFRE, we pushed as, strong as, as strongly as we might, uh, encouraged, uh, asked for, um, that people would attain their CFRE within two years of joining our team. And we would support them and we would provide uh, funding to pursue that uh, their credential and really give them every encouragement and assistance we could. But asked for all that because that gave a stronger sense of quality assurance, if you will, in terms of the folks working, particularly in senior roles, knowing what they needed to know to do their job. It wasn't something that we were successful with with everyone and ultimately recognising that's a choice you make, but certainly with many. And that also trickled down into the broader team. So it was probably not coincidental that in the team that I actually ultimately had responsibility for and leading, there was a significant representation of folks that attain their CFRE and still maintain that in different organisations they work in now. These days I'm more involved in boards, so I've stepped out of executive roles, but I'm certainly in governance roles. And once again, it's a bit harder to lean into that from a board level. It's not appropriate to be jumping into that deeply, but I would still recognise the same need and opportunity even to inform from a board perspective the value of practice credentialing sitting alongside of other markers of professional identity. So as much as possible to encourage that to be something that exists uh, within a staff team and working with CEOs, working with management to actually identify that as being a value proposition. I mean, the risk of not doing that is you open up a very random scenario of who you employ. So you're then relying on yeah. other points of knowledge of what people bring, and the fact that there are no formal education pathways in fundraising practice is another point that potentially weakens that proposition. So you're not only looking at folk that uh, may have not uh, underpinned their knowledge in an education pathway, they're also 
not affirming that through a practice credential. So there's a lot of uh, fluidity, if you will, in, in terms of what that practice base might be informed with. And I actually think that it creates material risk for any organisation. So anyone in a governance role should actually be concerned about the risk that's presented in not having uh, the evidenced capability from a staff leadership perspective. And I think that is true too from a senior executive position. So you know, I think perhaps there's a really strong argument for institutional leadership at both board and executive level to lean into this question a lot more heavily than they probably do and be clear about who they're employing. They wouldn't take that same risk in a financial position. If you didn't, I don't see too many organisations employing anyone to be a CFO. They'll look for evidence of qualifications and practice credentials in that domain. Exactly. So why on earth would you not do that in a fundraising context as well? Yeah, and we hear people say that you wouldn't hire an accountant who wasn't qualified, and yet you have fundraisers who potentially are dealing with millions of dollars talking to donors that are high net worth, that are building corporate sponsorships, but they may not have proven any fundraising base knowledge at all. And the crazy thing about that is that your fundraising team are your front line of your organisation in terms of reaching out to your broader constituency. Yes, you, your service folk are actually in the, the service delivery piece, that's true, but you're actually entrusting people to a really significant area of representation and relationship management with what is potentially a loose or random set of uh, points of comfort around what they actually bring to that role. And I, I, I use the word risk really deliberately. I think that directors are clearly focused on risk and revenue. So that is a strong argument in terms of thinking about where practice credentialing fits in that. And, and likewise, the same responsibility sits with the executive leadership and organisation. So I, I think it's increasingly questionable, even potentially slightly negligent, but not to actually give yourself the best possible opportunity of employing people who have the strongest argument around their capability sets. Yeah, absolutely, because there's a lot on the line. You've got nonprofit mm -hmm. reputation, you've got staff morale, all of that feeds in. And, and those issues are getting increasingly heavier in terms of organisational responsibility, certainly not lighter. So I think that uh, Speaking as someone who's been in those leadership roles and continues to be in leadership roles in the governance context, I wouldn't be comfortable at all in not at least attending to their comfort. That doesn't mean the organisations I'm involved with have uh, a whole bunch of folk who are necessarily CFRE yet, but it's a conversation that I find myself actively promoting and encouraging to try as best you might to raise that bar. That's excellent. Well, thank you, Nigel, so much for chatting with me today and a massive congratulations on 30 years as a CFRE. That's a thank fantastic you. milestone. And the fact that of the cohort of people who started in Australia in 1993, you are still in the profession and you are still holding the credentials. So everyone at CFRE International thanks you for that and congratulate you on such a wonderful career achievement. Uh, thanks very much, Ashley, and thanks very much for the opportunity to chat today. Thanks.